All right, mathematicians, let's continue with our proofs. Proving statements about segments and angles, section 2.5. Our essential question is how can you prove a mathematical statement? So our objectives are that mathematicians will be able to write two column proofs as we practiced yesterday with our algebraic proofs. Also name and prove properties of congruence. All right, so we will continue with our, using our inductive reasoning skills. In other words, we will make some observations in order to learn more about proofs. All right, so as we continue our introductions to proofs, just think of when you're writing a proof as you're just, your job is to complete a puzzle. So you start with the given information and have to reach the goal statement. You must show your logic to prove that you can get the desired result. So to do this, you need to justify every statement that you make. Your statements and justifications link together to form the proof. All right, so this unit will focus on the two column style proof, but we will also get familiar with the other two options. So before we begin writing the formal proofs, we need a few building blocks of knowledge that, we will, that will become our justifications. We've been working on this already. Our justifications can be properties, postulates, theorems that have already been proven or accepted as true. So we have our implied statements on page 10, and then our notes where we have formal proofs, uh, sorry, theorems as well. All right, so here's our three types of proofs. We've got the flowchart proof, looks like this, a bunch of bubbles with some arrows. We've got paragraphs, so it looks like a paragraph similar to what you would write in English class. And then you have your two column proof that we've already been introduced to in the previous lesson. All right, so in your notes, just write these four statements for flowchart proof, and then do a rough sketch of this example. Basically, flowchart proofs are statements written in each box. Justifications are written below the box. Arrows lead us to the next statement, and we usually see them arranged left to right or top to bottom. All right, our paragraph proofs, proofs um, just write these four statements. Basically, they begin with the given statement. You use complete sentences throughout the proof. You insert conjunctions and transition words for clarity, and you combine justifications with each statement. You do not need to write this example. I'm just showing you what it can look like. All right, and then in your two column proofs, since we've already become familiar with them, just jot down these four statements in your notes and this example if you need it. But basically you start with a given, work from top to bottom, list the statements in the left column, list the corresponding reasons in the right column. And we will continue to use our properties of equality. This was introduced in the previous lesson, but I'm just putting it here as a refresher. So you can go back to page 88 to refresh your memory on the properties of equality. And this leads us to the properties of congruence. So now I have these images over here to kind of help us with these properties. Our reflexive property of congruence is when you have the same thing on both sides. And that's true for both segment length and angle measure. So here we have segment AB congruent to itself, just like we have angle A congruent to itself. This is the reflexive property of congruence. Our symmetric property is where we kind of like rearrange and switch. But we have this like reflection line that we reflect across. So it's symmetric on both sides. So if AB is congruent to CD, then CD is also congruent to AB. Same with our angles. If angle A is congruent to angle B, then angle B is congruent to angle A. Our transitive property, similar to um, equality, in, instead we would use congruence. So if segment AB is congruent to CD, and CD is congruent to EF, then AB is congruent to EF. In other words, AB and EF are congruent to the same segment, so they must be congruent to each other. I can say the same thing about our angles. If angle A is congruent to angle B and angle B is congruent to angle C, then A must be congruent to C. All right, so we will be using our segment addition postulate, so this is just a quick refresh. You can go back to your interactive notebook, page 36, section 1.2 to refresh. Also, this is our implied statement for segment addition postulate, so we'll use this postulate in our geometric proofs. We will also use the angle addition postulate. So the, here's a refresh. Section 1.5 was where it was introduced to us. Our implied adjacent angles implies angle addition postulate. So we have this postulate that we can also use in our geometric proofs. And essentially with proofs, you just have to make a plan. So I provided this exact 
these exact steps in your notes already, so you don't have to write any of this down. Just flip to the last page of your notes for today's lesson, and you'll see this exact item, just not in color. So if you want to fill it in with colors, go for it. But we'll reference this to kind of help us get through proofs during class when we practice. All right, so let's just review some of our algebra proof key points. <clears throat> so if we're given an equation, and we want to prove, in this case, that x equals 11 fourths. So the problem will contain at least one given statement. Your end result must be the statement you are asked to prove. In other words, this is our goal. Our goal is to prove, in this case, x equals 11 fourths. So we look also at um, the first column contains a series of statements that leads us logically from the given statement or statements, if there's more than one, to the fact that we are proving. So we always start with our first given, and our justification or reason is the word given. Make sure you number both sides, so both your statements and your justifications and columns. The second column does contain the justifications for each statement. So every statement has a justification. Line one always contains the first given. I mentioned that already. Justifications can include definitions, properties, postulates, and theorems that have already been accepted as true. So this is where we need to reference our implied statement list. So here we go. Now here's a two column sample proof pertaining to geometry. Again, your givens are first. You'll always copy them exactly as they are in the given statements. They may go one after the other, or they may be the first one used at the beginning, but then maybe other givens are used later in the proof. They don't have to be the first two statements. Um, justifications for both given statements is simply that we were given the statement. So I physically see the word given for whatever statements are given. And then anytime you use multiple statements to make a conclusion, you have to reference that in parentheses. So for this one, we use substitution, the transitive property of congruence, to conclude that angle ABC is congruent to angle JKL. So we use both of these statements one and two, and that's referenced on statement three. It's justification. All right, we do not always need all of this provided space, so the proof in this case is kind of short, but sometimes they're a little bit longer than this. All right, so let's just do a quick practice with this first example. We're gonna write a two column proof for the situation example four from section 2.4 lesson. So we've actually seen this already. We're given that the measure of angle 1 equals the measure of angle 3, and we want to prove that the measure of angle DBA, let's take a look at DBA, here's DBA. So DBA is a combination of 2 and 3, so that's probably something we can use in our proof. We want to prove that it's equal to measure of angle EBC, let's take a look at EBC, here's EBC. Well EBC is an addition of 1 and 2, so that's something we can use in our proof as well. So all these ideas kind of thinking through the proof. I'm, this is my goal statement, so this is what I want to get to as my final conclusion. But I have to start here. All right, so let's get started. Set up your two columns, statements on the left, reasons on the right, and your first statement is always your first given. Reason, given. So that should be easy points right there. Where can I go from here? Well, I want to prove that DBA is congruent to the measure of angle EBC. And as I mentioned earlier, we can say somewhere something about using the uh, angle addition postulate to say that two and three combined or added together equals DBA and that one and two added together equals EBC. So that needs to be somewhere in the proof. So let's take a look. So we can do exactly that. We can say measure of angle DBA equals the measure of angle three plus measure of angle two and that's using the angle addition postulate. In other words, adjacent angles implies angle addition postulate. Well, I mentioned in the given that measure of angle 3 equals measure of angle 2, so I can use substitution to say that measure of angle 1 plus measure of angle 2 equals measure of angle DBA, since 3, measure of angle 3 in the given equals measure of angle 1. So I've used the substitution property of equality to write this third statement. 
All right, so now I need to get in a relationship for measure of angle EBC. So measure of angle BC equals measure of angle 1 plus measure of angle 2. So that's using the angle addition postulate. And now I have enough information to conclude that those two angles are equal to each other by substitution because they're equal to the same sum of measure of angle 1 and 2. So that's using the transitive property of equality. Done. My goal is complete. There's my final conclusion. Measure of angle DBA is equal to measure of angle EBC. All right, with the example two, let's just make sure we know how to use our properties of congruence correctly. So let's just practice on these two examples. If angle T congruent to angle V and angle V is congruent to angle R, then angle T is congruent to angle R. So basically we're saying that angle V is congruent to two different angles. So those two different angles must be congruent to each other. That's the transitive property. Next example, we have if segment JL is congruent to YZ and then YZ is congruent to JL. Well, that's the symmetric property of congruence. All right, I just want to throw in a few reminders. Remember that angle measures are numbers and can be equal. Angles are figures and can be congruent. Notice we drop the M notation when we're talking about congruence. When we're talking about measure, we have equality. When we're talking about objects or figures, we're talking about them being congruent. So same size, same shape. That's also true for lengths of segments. They're numbers and can be equal. So we say length of MN, no bar above, equal to length of ST, no bar above. And then segments are figures as well. They're objects, so they have congruence. So that's where we name it with the bar and we say congruent. So object segment G GH is congruent to object segment CD. This is an important reminder. All right, so let's do a quick check for understanding the difference between equality and congruence. Take these five examples, determine whether each statement is acceptable and explain. So pause the video here, take a moment to think through each statement, paying attention to notation to see if they are acceptable or not. All right, so here are the ones that are unacceptable, numbers one, three, and five. So what would I do to fix them? For number one, remember measure has equality. So I need little m's right here in front of my angle symbols for this to be an accurate statement. What would I fix here on number three? Congruence is on objects. So I would need objects, so a segment bar right above my two segments to fix it. For number five, length has equality, so I would need to take away the bars. These two are correct. All right, so let's continue to practice with example three. Write a two column proof for the symmetric property of segment congruence. All right, again, you're always starting with what you're given. We're given that segment LM is congruent to segment NP. Well, if that's not marked on your picture, go ahead and mark it. In this case, it is, so we're good to go. We're trying to prove that segment NP is congruent to segment LM, so this is our goal. Where do we start? We start with a two-column proof, statements on the left, reasons on the right, and our first given. All right, since I know that LM is congruent to NP, I know that next I can conclude equality of lengths because congruence implies equal lengths. So my next statement is that the length of LM equals the length of NP because congruence implies equal lengths. And then I can use my symmetric property to rearrange. So now I can say NP equals LM. That's the symmetric property of equality. And now I'm back to being able to say that the segment NP is congruent to segment LM. And that's because equal length implies congruent segments. All right, for this proof, I want you to just pause the video here and try this one on your own. And we will go over it in class and clarify any questions about the two column proofs. Good luck and bring clarifying questions to class. 